Welcome to The Contemplative Life. Three pastors, friends, and spiritual companions help us explore spirituality through a contemplative lens. I'm Christina Roberts. I'm Chris Roberts. I'm Christina Kaiser. We're glad you joined us. Hello, it's great to be with you. Today, we're continuing our self-care series where we're talking to people from varying backgrounds about their life experiences and what they've learned over the years, particularly around the area of self-care. Joining us is Mary Boris, talking about self-care for military families. Mary is a military spouse of 22 years, having navigated the challenges and adventures of a nomadic lifestyle, which has included moving 10 times, four of those including overseas tours. She's also a loving and dedicated mother to twins, adding an extra layer of complexity and joy to their journey. And if that wasn't enough, Mary has taken her experiences and now uses that in her life coaching business, helping to guide others. So we are excited to learn from Mary's wisdom and experience today. So Mary, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. So as we consider self-care for military families, I think for me, the first obvious thing that comes to mind is, my gosh, you have moved a lot of times in your life, both um, as a newly married couple, but then also with children and having to start over again so many times, right? Everything from where are the stores located to getting acclimating into your new home. And so I'm curious, what are some ways that you have learned to adapt to new circumstances over the years? Maybe our listeners haven't moved quite so many times, but I think many of us have had new circumstances. And so what have you learned through that in your life? Yeah, so it is hard. And the hardest is finding a hairdresser. I'm going to be honest, word of mouth and lots of suggestions. But I would say it is really hard. And when we first got married 22 years ago and we started, it it definitely was a struggle to move and to fit in. It was something that I had never done. I went to college in my hometown. I never lived in the dorm or anything. Moving for the first time, it, it took a toll on me. And I didn't want to admit it because I think that women in general want to be strong. And it was very hard for me to say that I needed help. And I think that is a huge part of self-care is admitting that you can't do it all and you don't need to do it all. And with each move, I mentally prepare myself knowing that it is going to be a challenge and it is going to be like a good six months before I really feel like I'm in the groove. But what has helped me is channeling the things that I like. So when we moved to Hawaii, my husband wasn't with me. And that was a challenge in itself, not knowing anyone. And I looked for a softball team. And I just looked in the newspaper and found a softball team. And it turned out to be amazing. It was other spouses. And these have turned into friends that have lasted the entire time that we've been in the military. Another thing that I looked for was book clubs. And for the military, we're lucky and not so lucky because it can be blessing and a curse, but we have spouse clubs. And that's a great way for us to meet new people who are sharing the similar struggles that we have every day. As I'm listening to you talk, I'm thinking of my husband's sister's best friend who also married in to this like military family experience. And so some of their stories go through my head as well. And I'm wondering, maybe do you have things to share around how do you learn to cope and how do you learn to adapt in these environments that are constantly changing? Have you developed skills for this kind of a thing over the years? Yes and no. It's definitely each move is unique. And after the first one and really discovering how hard that was. Change for me from being a little girl was always challenging. I don't like change. And it's funny now, I probably a year into each tour, I'm like, okay, well, where are we going to go next? Have you started to talk to the detailers? And, but I would say really reaching out to people who have been there before. So for me, learning from senior spouses and for me, I'm an extrovert. So it's fairly easy for me to put myself in a situation where I can go introduce myself and ask 10 million questions. And even though I am a natural extrovert, I realize how hard 
that is for me to keep that up, that energy. And so I know for a lot of people that it's hard to put yourself out there, but that's definitely something that has helped me just going into each duty station as, okay, this is a two-year adventure, a three-year adventure. What can we learn? What can we explore? Who are we going to meet? Just having this attitude of why not? Mary, I love hearing you talk about parts of your life that that are part of your formation, such as change being difficult, not something that that was a part of your younger life, and being extroverted, talking about your extroversion and how you've embraced that and also noting some challenges. But what are some shocking things that you found out about yourself and your actual need for self-care in this whole adventure of being a military wife? So I would say the most shocking thing was at the beginning and just realizing, so let's back up. Newly married, excited, moving to our first duty station. I've never left St. Louis. And this is the first time that I'm looking for a job where I'm not already known in my industry. And I struggled. It didn't, it wasn't a quick thing. It wasn't like I applied and the next day I got a job. And Washington, D.C. is a very difficult place to make friends, I think. And I think it's probably because it's the word is not coming to me. It's not touristy, but it's you're just like an in and out. Yeah, Transient. thank you. Transient, yes. A transient town. I struggled to make friends. I struggled to find a job. And that took a toll on my marriage. And a few months into it, it was, okay, you need to do your four years and then you need to get out because this isn't going to work for me. And that wasn't going to work for him. And thankfully, he brought it to my attention that I needed to probably see someone. And it was very hard for me to accept that. And I was a psychology major in college, of course. And that made a whole lot of difference. And it wasn't failure or anything like that to go see someone and get put on medication And I knew when we moved to Hawaii and I was going to be by myself, I went ahead and talked to the doctor and said, hey, let's be proactive here. And I think that being proactive and just realizing how strong I am and that I can handle Pete being deployed for nine months, I can handle the kids on my own. It may suck at certain times, but I can do this. And I think that's not necessarily surprising, but just reaffirming. And I realized I forgot to mention this in the intro, but Mary's actually my cousin. And so I've known Mary my entire life and it's just been really neat. She's two years younger than me just to watch your journey over the years and the transformation that's happened and taking some of what you've learned personally and, and through your family. And now you have a life coaching business and you help others. And so I know we haven't touched at all on your parenting aspect. I know we had mentioned that you have twins and that happened during your 22 years. And so I wonder if you want to touch a little bit on what it's like parenting in the military and things that you've learned self-care as families, because that's different than your personal self-care. Absolutely. So it was a struggle to get pregnant in the first place. And we faced infertility, I think it was a nine-year struggle before we finally had the girls and the joy of having kids. Yes, that's exciting and all of that. And I've always been a career woman and it was interesting. So we had the babies and I had the most amazing job at that point. I was the chief of protocol at Andrews Air Force Base and I was greeting world leaders when they were coming in. It was the most amazing job ever. And then I finally get pregnant, which was amazing because we've struggled so long. And then I put in my notice and my boss was like, look, let's not do this. Let's wait and see how it is. And I had the babies and I struggled with postpartum, which was, and I have never felt so less confident in myself as a person or as a mother or anything. And I briefly thought about going back to work and had it all scheduled. I went to look at the CDC, the Child Development Center, which we have on bases. And my boss pushed me up the list so we could get in there. And I went and I was like, I can't do this. I can't leave my kids. And that that was hard, that decision to 
be a stay-at-home mom. And I think that's hard for a lot of military spouses is that we are moving every two or three years, whether we have kids or we don't have kids, and you are losing your identity because everything is wrapped around your spouse, who is the active duty member. And um, giving up your career or not having your family around for um, help when you are lonely or you do have these kids that you're raising. So that was really difficult. And I would say Pete and I, Pete, my husband, were really a great team when we had those babies. And he, which is huge, and I see so many people who don't necessarily have that luxury of a hands-on dad, and I think it's important to be able to communicate with your spouse and ask for that kind of support. But we really had this tag team thing going where he would come home from work, we would have dinner together, and then I would go to bed really like around seven o'clock so that I could get a chunk of at least four hours before I had to wake up for feedings. And that way, the next day I could function a little bit better. And he's already a night owl, so it wasn't a big deal for him to stay up later. It helped me tremendously. And I would say another thing that has been important to my self-care routine and surviving, excuse me, is time away. And this really started even like the girls were just six months and I left for a weekend and I was still local and I was with another girlfriend. But that's something I think that is so important to be able to get away and to recharge. And it's something that I haven't done since we've been living overseas again, because challenges of being in a foreign country that doesn't necessarily speak English and all of that kind of stuff. But it's something that I would even do without a friend. I would just go to a hotel once a quarter, maybe locally, and binge whatever I wanted to watch and read whatever I wanted. One time, it was like right before Christmas, and I even brought my cricket machine with me to make presents for everybody. But I think it's just really important to take that time for yourself. These are all so helpful and probably helpful even beyond, am I, do I have that same story of being a military family? Don't we all need connections in our lives and time for ourselves and all of this? So thank you for sharing all of these little tidbits of your story. I'm wondering if you looked backwards, is there something you would want your younger self to know? Are there things that you would want to tell yourself if you could go back? It's all going to be okay. I, again, change wasn't a big thing for me when I was growing up and you can't get any more different than marrying someone in the military. And for someone who knew nothing about the military, I thought we were going to be poor. I thought it was for uneducated people who didn't have any other options and quickly understood that's not what the military is about. But it's funny. So I met my husband and we dated for six months before we got engaged. And I think it was on our third date that he told me he was going to join the military. I was like, whatever, this guy's crazy. He's going to fall in love with me. He's going to move back to St. Louis and we're going to live happily ever after. And so he, this is 2000 and 2001. And he was reassuring me before he leaves for officer candidate school, which is a boot camp for officers, basically. And he's, we haven't been to war in forever. It's fine. It's safe. And because all I know about the military is watching movies and World War II movies and everybody's shooting and everybody dies. And this is what I'm anticipating. So he leaves. And two weeks later, 9-11 happens. And clearly the entire world changes at that moment. And I can't talk to Pete. He is on lockdown because he's just been in... OCS for two weeks. And here I am, I'm envisioning the worst possible that could happen. Pete is leaving. Pete is going overseas. He's going to get killed. It's going to be a war. It's going to be be horrible. And I think what I would tell myself is just relax and take it day by day. And instead of looking at the glass half empty, look at it as half full and it's going to be okay. I love that. I think one of the things that, that that comes to me is hearing you talk and hearing about change and all the moves that happen. You probably don't know this, Mary, but I recently completed a year of Benedictine formation. And one of the one of the values of the Benedictine life is this notion of stability. And stability 
a lot of people think of stability as a location, but one of the things that I've come to learn is stability is a place in the heart. And I'm curious, where do you go for stability? What is a stabilizing thing? Where's that place in your heart? That's a great question. And sorry, just to go back a second with Benedictine training, is there like a silence kind of dedication or something like that? Are you going to take a vow of silence for a year or something? I did. I did write a rule of life. And we could talk more about that if you okay. want, but my rule of life has to do with hospitality and ongoing learning and conversion and deep listening to other people. So this is a, actually a part of my, my rule of life is deep, deeply listening to you and your story right now. I love it. I do want to learn more about it, but to answer you, where do I go? I think that I am a strong person. And there is a lot of inner reflection for me. And I do turn to myself for a lot of stuff. Not to say that going to someone else is a weakness or anything like that. But I do have this self-confidence about myself that I can handle this. And I've proved to myself that I can handle the challenges that life brings to me. I also, I do have good family and I have a great friend who is a rock to me. And so I don't know if that necessarily is answering what you're looking for, but yeah. And when you say it's not necessarily a location and being in the military, moving every couple of years for the last 22 years and people ask, where are you from? And even my girls who are not from St. Louis, they identify as being from St. Louis, which I love. I think that's a great answer. So Mary, I wonder if you can take the last few minutes just to tell us a little bit about your coaching business and whether someone is personally in the military listening to this, or I think everybody knows somebody who knows somebody or whatever that may benefit from what you have to offer. And so maybe you could take a few minutes to share about that. Thanks. Yeah. Not only do I do life coaching and it's mostly with women and it's mostly confidence coaching, but I'm also branching out into etiquette coaching And I think they really go hand in hand and etiquette isn't this antiquated notion of grandmothers and doilies and suspenders and things like that. It's knowing etiquette rules is really a respect for yourself and a respect for others and the way that you're interacting with them. And I think that if you are confident in knowing that you can handle any situation that's thrown at you, your confidence obviously grows. And it's something that I love doing. I've been a party planner. So it's something that's natural to me. As far as the confidence coaching and life coaching, there are so many opportunities that we allow to pass us by. Because as women, I think that we really put ourselves low on the totem pole of priorities in our life, whether it's because of our active duty husband or because of our children and their never ending sports schedules or whatever. Our self-care is always at the bottom and we don't necessarily feel confident enough telling people what we need or doing the things that we know would benefit us. And that's really where my coaching has come from. I've had amazing moments in my life, really because of the military and moving all of these every couple of years, but I've developed this why not attitude and I think it's just amazing that. I've met the prime minister of Greece because here it was, I finally got my job that I wanted at Andrews Air Force Base and my first day he's arriving and I took it upon myself to step up on the red carpet, which I wasn't supposed to do, but I did it because when was I ever going to see the prime minister of Greece again? And it's just these moments that I want people to be able to have and create their own why not moments. I love it. And we will include in the show notes, but it's maryboris.com if anybody wants to reach out and talk more to Mary. Any final thoughts before we leave today? This has been so fun. Thank you so much for letting me share a little bit about myself and the challenges that military families face. At the same time, it is a pretty amazing life being a military family. So yeah. Great. Thanks for joining us. Great to have you. Thanks. And now is the part of the podcast where we talk about what we are into. So what are we into, my friends? 
I am on the hunt for the perfect pumpkin candle. I haven't found it, but I'm into it. So my go-to store is out of them, which I'm super bummed about, but I am not going to be deterred. I'm on the hunt for the perfect pumpkin candle. I wish you well in your pumpkin candle hunting. I am into celebrating that I turned in the first draft of my doctoral project yesterday. So it's been a long time coming. There's three phases to this thing. And it, even though they finished at the end of August, it's it was like a, a month and a half of, okay, what does it all mean? And then writing it and then figuring out how to make tables of contents and appendixes and so it's in and now it's in somebody else's hands and they can tell me what they want from me, but I can sleep soundly as I did last night. So that is what I am into. I love it. And by the time this goes live, you will hopefully be Dr. Christina Kaiser, which is so fun. We will have a second celebration. I am into frequent flyer hacks. I, every now and again, will get into all of the frequent flyer credit cards and hacks and bonus miles. And I am loving it. Like you, you do this. And then there's all these like windows. If you spend X amount between now and this month, you get like 10,000 bonus. And so I'm all into it. Chris just had a trip that cost him $11 because you have to pay the taxes and I'm looking forward to some other fun trips. So I am all into frequent flyer travel hacks. Well, it was great to be with you. And until next time, make it a great week. If you enjoy listening to the podcast, we invite you to stay connected by signing up for our Foundry Spiritual Center newsletter, where you can learn about even more programs and offerings. You'll find a link to subscribe in the show notes or visit us anytime at foundrysc.com. Thanks again for being with us. We hope you have a great week.